I want to thank the referee in case they're out there. Uh, I don't know who they are, and I also don't know who's listening to me, but there's a chance that they are. Okay, so this is a joint work with uh, Yorgos uh, Dimitro Rizal. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about um, some uh, sort of rigidity results you can prove for Legendrian submanifolds of contact manifolds using um, Legendrian contact algebra. Uh, and if time, I'll mention where this word persistence comes in because it really only comes in in the proof. Okay. Um, and uh, one final thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of people who work in, uh, with floor theory, persistence, uh, contact dynamics. And so <clears throat> at the risk of, it's, I figure it's probably better to offend everyone than just a few people. So I'm just uh, I'm not gonna mention any names um, of other people. Um, but I, uh, if you're interested uh, in the, who's done re related results, uh, you could look at our preprint. Uh, we have a fair amount of um, citations there. Um, okay, so let me just start with a um, symplectic motivation. Um, okay, so supposing I have, uh, let's say W is a uh, symplectic manifold and um, H is a time Hamiltonian, a time dependent Hamiltonian. Okay, and with this H we can define um, a Hamiltonian isotopy uh, from the symplectic manifold to itself, um, uh, defined by um, d by dt uh, is uh, the Hamiltonian vector field. We're here, uh, just recall that uh, uh, up to some sign, I guess, um, you define this Hamiltonian vector field this way. Okay. Um, and let's say that uh, L is a um, closed uh, Lagrangian. Okay, and then we have this Arnold conjecture, um, uh, which says that, okay, supposing L is transverse to uh, its image under the time one map, uh, then uh, if you wanna count the number of intersections, uh, it's greater than or equal to um, the sum of its Betty numbers. Um, so, uh, so like if you took it, if you took a simple example here. Um, let's say uh, W is a cotangent bundle of S one, and uh, we had some we had some Lagrangian here. You looked at its image. Okay, then you'd see that uh, uh, the number of intersections um, in this case is two and the sum of the Betty numbers is two. So here it would be true. On the other hand, if you took a Lagrangian like this, uh, so same symplectic manifolds, and now you had, this is your Lagrangian, uh, you could perform a, uh, Hamiltonian isomorphism, and uh, you wouldn't have uh, at least two intersections anymore. Okay, so um, so this is not actually how Arnold stated the conjecture, so I'm not, I shouldn't really say his conjecture is false with this counterexample, but this is just an illustration of how, how this lower bound doesn't hold. Okay, so, but then what you could do instead um, is you could look at, um, for L, you could look at the supremum of so all uh, almost uh, omega compatible almost complex structures, uh, and then in within this uh, supremum, you could look at the infimum of all maps, uh, all maps of the disk, sending the boundary to L, uh, which are J holomorphic, and you could look at the area of this thing. So. Uh, of such disks. So um, for example, uh, here I have some disk uh, and I have some map U sending it to here. Um, and then you could define um, 
so that this is one quantity, sigma L. Uh, and you can also define um, the Hoffer norm for one of these Hamiltonians, which, um, so this was in the talk this morning, through a couple hours ago, but let me just remind you. Uh, so it's, you take the maximum minus, uh, over W, over the symplectic manifold, minus the minimum of the symplectic manifold, and you integrate that. Um, and then there's a theorem that, uh, uh, due to some people, um, that uh, supposing uh, we have that uh, L uh, is transverse to its image and the Hamiltonian is less than this quantity, sigma L, uh, then uh, you still have this result that the number of intersection points is greater than or equal to the sum of the Betty numbers. And the proof is roughly, um, so because the Hoffer norm is below this quantity, sigma L, you can define um, Lagrangian floor homology, um, which is equal to the Morse homology. Um, and this Lagrangian floor homology, well, it's the homology of the, the um, floor chain complex of L and phi of L, which is uh, equal to, which is generated by, let's just say Z2 coefficients for now, uh, the intersections of these guys. This, uh, this chain complex here. Okay, so uh, that's roughly sort of the idea. So as long as this is a small Hamiltonian in this, in this sense, uh, the floor homology theory works and we get this uh, result. Okay. Um, so when I was teaching my class, I was trying to make it look more anal uh, digital or continuous, but this was just way too hard. So I'm gonna try this for now. Let's see how long this lasts. Um, okay, so now uh, as a contact geometer, I'd wanna know what the contact version of this story is. Okay, so uh, let's just set up some notation. So I have uh, an odd dimensional manifold, M, a two n dimensional distribution. Uh, let's say that's our, that's our contact manifold. Um, and let's say we have a contact form alpha. So that means uh, for those that don't know that C is in the kernel, is the kernel of alpha. Um, and then I have a, uh, a ray vector field, uh, sorry, a ray, yeah. Ray vector fields uh, R alpha for this contact form. So again, so just in case you're more symplectic uh, and don't know these, I'll just write this down. So it's defined this way. Okay, and then I have a uh, time dependent contact Hamiltonian. Um, contact, I guess it's called, uh, but still just function and uh, you can define, using this contact form, you can define a contact uh, Hamiltonian isotopy, uh, which I'll denote by phi T alpha to emphasize the fact that it does depend on alpha, the contact form. So, okay. Um, oh right, yeah, and then also one more notation. Uh, we need uh, the analog of Lagrangian, so that in case is gonna be a uh, closed uh, uh, Legendrian submanifold. Okay, uh, which where the dimension of lambda is a little bit less, it's n, and the tangent space of lambda is in the contact distribution. Okay, so uh, an example, I'll just draw one because um, it'll be useful later. Uh, let's take uh, M to be the standard contact, well, standard contact R3, which I'm going to write as the one jet space of R. Uh, so you could be also thought of as a cotangent bundle of R cross R, uh, where uh, the, there we have an X direction and a Z direction. Uh, our contact form is uh, going to be DZ minus uh, Y DX. Okay. And uh, to, to illustrate Legendrians, it's easiest, at least for me, to uh, consider the front projection uh, of lambda. So the front projection goes from 
J1 of, let's say, I'm going to call this space, well, J1 of, let's call it R to Rx cross Rz. Um, so we uh, only need to draw the z direction and the x direction. And a Legendrian might be drawn some, something like this. Okay. Um, and uh, you recover the y coordinate by just taking uh, the derivative of z with respect to x. And the last piece of information in this case for this contact form alpha, um, the Reeb uh, vector field is d by dz. Okay, so um, you might say, okay, so uh, last time we were looking at intersections of Lagrangians, so uh, why don't we just look for intersections of Legendrians and try to say something about that? Uh, but the problem is, is that even if h is small, if the, the Hoffer norm of h is small, um, I could still, um, with a small Hamiltonian, move lambda to uh, this guy. And um, because the y coordinate is given by the derivative, you can see that this point right here is actually not an intersection point. They have different y coordinates. So I've displaced. Um, uh, I've displaced the Legendrian from itself. Um, there's no intersections. Okay. Um, so, but what there still is, is there is, yes. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, it looks like you can't actually do a contact version of this at first glance. Uh, but so the goal in this talk is um, instead of uh, looking, trying to say something about the intersections of a Legendrian, uh, of a Legendrian and its image, uh, let's bound um, the number of reb, reb chords uh, between uh, the Legendrian and itself. So this is, this is, um, flows of uh, the Reeb vector field uh, between the Legendrian and uh, its image. Okay, so in this case, um, it's a little bit hard to see, but maybe there's like, well, actually there's probably a whole S1, but if I perturb it a little bit, I just have a couple. So these are, these are uh, the points are supposed to be the same Y coordinates. So these tangent planes are supposed to be the same. Uh, so here you see that um, the rape chords uh, the, is not the empty set in this case. Um, and again, uh, if you look at um, the Legendrian here, um, so you can kind of imagine the rape flows. Well, I should really just pick, trace that like that. So we want to see how can we push lambda off of this green guy instead of the blue guy in the contact manifold. Okay, so so uh, some reasons for considering this modified goal. Um, so first of all, uh, this is the correct dimension uh, because uh, we have an n-dimensional Legendrian plus uh, an n plus one dimensional image of the, the free flow of the uh, the free flows off of the Legendrian, that's equal to the ambient dimension. Um, also, uh, this is sort of the, dy the dy dynamical analog in contact geometry. So we have the Arnold chord conjecture. Um, question, are reap chords between the two or from one to the other? Is negative time allowed? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so a priori, uh, they could go in either direction. So I just, I just said between the two, not from one to the other. Um, okay, so we have the uh, Arnold chord conjecture, uh, the Weinstein conjecture. Uh, these are sort of uh, what one would consider maybe the contact versions of, of the Ar uh, Arnold conjecture from the previous slide. And then finally, of course, uh, if we want to prove something, uh, so, um, if you look at the Reeb chords from a Legendrian, between a Legendrian and its image, um, 
this, uh, this generates um, the Legendrian contact algebra, uh, which is the, uh, which I haven't defined yet, but, it, but let's just say for now, it's the contact analog um, of the floor theory, the Lagrangian floor theory that we were talking about on the last sheet. Um, so, uh, and we'll just say that, um, you know, uh, a Hamiltonian displaces a Legendrian from itself if uh, you can uh, move, uh, if, this, if this set of read chords is uh, empty. Okay, so that's kind of the symplectic analog. Okay, so um, now for some, I need to still get to the result. So uh, for now, the current setup is um, limited. Uh, so we want our we want to choose our contact manifold and contact form to be very special. Uh, it's going to be P cross R, let's say Z, um, and the contact form is DZ minus lambda. Uh, we're here, um, P D lambda uh, is an exact symplectic manifold. So, uh, so this includes the jet space example I was just drawing. Uh, and uh, the reasons for that is um, we have a couple of things we need in order to get results. Uh, the main one is that uh, we need a, a bifurcation invariance proof. of uh, Legendrian contact algebra, which I haven't defined yet, but for, this is more for people in the know. Uh, this, you can ignore these little reasons. Uh, another sort of, there are a few more things we need uh, that could probably get, we could probably get by with, uh, and that is a uh, sort of a large push-off um, in the read direction, um, and also, um, for our a more technical thing is that we need uh, we need to know certain things about moduli space of holomorphic curves to get our precise statement. Although we could get it probably, but uh, but that's not to say that it's limited to this. Uh, so in the future, one could try to imagine uh, doing this for a, a general contact manifold. Um, maybe if we actually used more of the barcode technology that's around um, the persistence homology uh, persistence homology theory that's around. Okay, but anyway, so for now, for this talk, uh, this is our setup. Uh, this is our contact manifold, and with a specific contact form also. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just, uh, I've mentioned Legendre contact algebra twice, and it's in the title of the talk. So let me just give uh, just a one quote, quote unquote slide version of this. Okay, so what is the Legendre contact differential graded algebra of lambda? Um, so, uh, so we start with an algebra. So this is a unital tensor algebra generated by uh, the Reeb chords uh, starting and ending on the Legendrian. So not constant Reeb chords, but um, yeah. Okay, and then the grading, I actually don't need the grading in this talk, but um, for, the, for those um, who, are, who know about floor homology, I'll just say that the grading is sort of related, is related to the grading and floor homology. So it's some kind of Maslow index uh, of a read chord. But again, it's not, that's not really relevant for this talk. Okay, now comes the interesting part. Um, okay, uh, so then we have uh, the differential. Okay, so let's fix, um, let's fix some chords. C0 to, to three, not through CN, which might also be C0. Um, so these are read chords. Um, and let's let, uh, okay, so I actually need uh, more than just rigid moduli space. So I need K dimensional moduli space. So M, K, C0, C1 through CN, or this might be an empty set. Uh, so this is gonna be equal to, uh, maybe I should actually draw a picture here. Right, so here's the, here's the, the symplectization picture that we need for this story. Okay, so uh, we, have our, we have our symplectic manifold M. 
Um, and we look at the uh, symplectization. So this is a, a so this is a symplectic manifold. Do you okay? Question: Do you require convexity in, at infinity finite tightness on P? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we do need Gromov compactness to work. So in addition to our Legendrian being finite. Uh, we do need to prevent holomorphic curves from going off to infinity with finite area. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, uh, so our symplectic manifold is M cross RT, uh, and our symplectic form is uh, D e to the T alpha. Uh-oh, might be out of lead already. Okay, so that's the end of the talk, oh, let's see. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, okay. And uh, we consider this, uh, sorry, this is not gonna be as dark. Uh, we consider this uh, cylindrical Legendrian. That's better. Okay, so, um, so here is our Lagrangian, a Legendrian, lambda. Um, and we have this L, okay. Um, all right, so that's our setup. And oh, also, yeah, we also have some chords. Here's like C0, here's like uh, C1 through Cn, so chords upstairs and downstairs. Um, and uh, we're studying, uh, so this is a K here, this is some integer, uh, some natural number, positive, non negative integer. Uh, so we're looking for maps. Um, uh, holomorphic maps from the disk with n punctures okay uh, to the Lagrangian so like this um, which, I'll, which I'll write in a sec draw in a, draw in a sec so first of all uh, it has to be holomorphic uh, second of all, okay, I'm just going to write this in really informal uh, notation. Uh, so as I approach a puncture, uh, I'm going to approach a reap chord uh, either at plus infinity or at negative infinity, depending upon which puncture I'm going towards. So something like this maybe. Uh, <clears throat> Not a good drawing, but anyway. Um, okay, and finally the K part. Um, so this is this we're going to assume is a manifold, and we need that the dimension uh, locally is K. Okay, and we're going to mod out by automorphisms of uh, of the disk. Okay, and so um, we can now use this to define the differential. Um, so uh, D of C0 is just um, you look at this moduli space, the one dimensional moduli space uh, with these boundary, with these uh, puncture conditions. You mod out by an R, this is the T direction. I don't know if I wrote that down, yeah. You mod out by RT translation, which always is, exists in this cylindrical setup. You make this count and you multiply it by the word C1 through CN. And uh, for us, this is gonna be, uh, I'm not gonna really emphasize what this is, let's just call it an element in some ground field K, which uh, usually is Z2, but uh, if you have certain conditions on the Legendrian, um, you could make it into ZP or, um, or R uh, if, uh, if we're dealing with a spin, if we have, anyway, I won't focus on that. So, some, some count and some coefficients. Okay, and then uh, you use Leibniz to, to get that D is a DGA map. Sorry, it's a, it's a map on the algebras. And then the theorem is that it's actually a DGA map. So the theorem is that um, uh, D squared equals zero. And um, uh, you can you define the Legendrian contact homology. Uh, one, two, you define the Legendrian contact homology 
of lambda to just be the homology of this differential graded algebra. Um, and it's a Legendrian isotopy invariant. Okay, so that in a, is a real uh, quick snapshot of Legendrian contact homology. Okay, ah, right. And there's a nice feature about this. Oh, uh, Leibniz. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> That was not Leibniz, but uh, their cousin Leibniz. Related to different, uh, yeah, I'm never gonna get that right. I finally learned that it's Euler, not Euler, though, so I'm good on that. Okay, so, um, uh, all right. So, um, so what did I wanna say? Oh yeah, so if you, if you take, a, if you take um, any Reeb chord, See, that might be red chord, any chord. Um, and you define uh, the length uh, just by integrating the, the contact form. Uh, you can extend this uh, to the algebra. And um, if you use Stokes' theorem, uh, you'll see that. Uh, the differential um, decreases the length. So, um, so if you fix some length, uh, let's say some length greater than zero, um, you can look at uh, the sub DGA, which is generated by chords. Well, okay, you can look at the um, sub algebra, which is generated by chords uh, such that uh, the length is less than L. And because of this remark, this is a sub DGA. Okay. So the other definition I wanted to throw in, and I'm close to the statement of the theorem. Well, two definitions away. Okay. Um, so the last definition that's maybe well known to people who work with this is augmentations. So we have a DGA morphism um, epsilon going from A to uh, the ground ring, the ground field here, this is viewed as a, as a DGA with zero differential, uh, is an augmentation. We call that an augmentation, that particular type of um, DGA morphism. And see, where am I over here? Um, so this is useful in computations, uh, and maybe I'll get to it in the proof. Uh, it also has some geometric interpretations using Lagrangian fillings. Um, so let me do one more, one example defi definition. So, um, so we have a, let's consider a, a loose Legendrian. So basically what that means is, um, I'll draw it in the front projection again, that you have, you have the existence of a chart in which it looks something like something like um, this. Okay, here comes the hard part. Oh boy. Okay. Um, guy goes here and then this is sort of behind. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, the existence of a chart in which uh, lambda looks like this. Um, and uh, there's a, a result uh, which says that uh, if you have such a chart, lambda is flexible. Um, which means that there's basically only formal, which I won't, I won't describe this, give anything more than what I'm saying now. Some, there's only formal uh, obstructions to the isotopy. Um, and so it's not rigid. Um, and um, if, you're, if you have a situation like that, uh, you can also find a little chord here, C, 
And you can find, if you want to compute uh, the differential of this chord, well, you have at least this disc. So with one puncture. And, uh, you know, I really should draw this in the simplectization, which will be way too hard. Um, so kind of the way one might draw it is something like this or downstairs in the base space, you might draw it something, something like this. And this sort of is the story. This is sort of the picture for a gradient flow tree, uh, which in some cases is a way to count holomorphic curves. Okay, so because of this disc, um, you get at least a one here. And in fact, you also get um, just a one uh, because if you make L of C small. Uh, you can easily see this if L of C is small. In fact, even without L of C being small, you should be able to say this. But at the very least, um, you have uh, this statement. Okay, so what does that imply? So that implies that zero is equal to one uh, in this Legendrian contact homology. Okay, so that implies that uh, the LCH vanishes. So for a loose Legendrian, uh, this whole theory, well, this part of the, the Legendrian contact homology is destroyed. Uh, also, I mentioned augmentations, which are useful for calculations, um, but we don't even have that uh, because if you just try to see what it means to be an augmentation, okay, so it's epsilon of one, so that's one. On the other hand, d epsilon of one, that's d one. Um, so, uh, sorry, d epsilon, yeah. So that is uh, not, that's zero, so those are not equal. So that implies that uh, this guy has no augmentation. Uh, but um, if we set L to be less than L of C, uh, where C is this chord here, uh, then, zero is not equal to one in the homology of this uh, DGA where we're only considering chords uh, of length less than L. And also uh, this DGA may have an augmentation. Okay, so, uh, so that would be the good news. So we can consider sort of a sub DGA and try to do what we say about the theory there. It's not an invariant theory, but maybe, uh, maybe we can say something. Okay, um, right, okay, so now, maybe I should yeah, start a new sheet. Okay, um, so let's get to the main results, finally. Okay, ah, no, actually, first we need a little technical definition. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so we're gonna fix, um, fix lambda in, in our uh, symplectic manifold. Uh, contact manifold, sorry. Uh, and now for k between uh, one and one less than the dimension of the Legendrian, we're gonna let um, sigma twiddle k, this is gonna play the role of sigma l, all the way back from the first slide about in the symplectic version. So it's gonna be the minimum of the lengths of Legendrian, uh, of chords, such that um, the moduli space of dimension K with a positive puncture at this thing and no specifications about the negative puncture is non-zero. Okay, and let's let uh, sigma K be the minimum of sigma K twiddle and sigma K N minus, sigma N minus K twiddle, where N again is the, um, the dimension of the Legendrian. Okay. Uh, and then for zero and n, I'm just gonna let uh, sigma zero be sigma n. There is, uh, there is no sigma zero because you have an R translation um, in the range. So we start at sigma one. Um, and so that's gonna be the minimum of LC where uh, mn of c comma, this is not empty. Um, and also, if you wanna improve it a little bit, you can also, you can restrict this set, uh, it's making the minimum bigger. 
because we want these numbers to be as big as possible. Big is better. So, so that we can require uh, that sum u in uh, this moduli space uh, pass through a um, given r cross point where you fix the point in our Lagrangian. Um, so I'll, uh, in an example, I'll, that might explain what I mean a bit more. An example I'll do a little bit, an example that I'm gonna do in a little bit, maybe this, uh, this uh, conditional makes sense. Okay, and let's uh, reorder these sigmas in a, non -de in a decreasing manner. Uh, so sigma i zero through sigma i one. Okay, finally, I can get to the theorem. Okay. Okay, so let's choose an L. So uh, it's gonna be um, bigger than zero, but it could be infinity, so I'll write it that way, uh, such that uh, this guy has an augmentation. So this is actually not any condition on lambda because I can always have one in here. So one has length zero, and so for some non-zero, this thing has an augmentation. Okay, and let's let let's pick a contact Hamiltonian. Such that its Hoffer norm is less than the minimum of this L and sigma IK, where it's up to you to determine what you want K to be. Just pick a K from zero to N. Okay, then uh, the number of rave chords between lambda and starting, uh, between lambda and its image under this contact Hamiltonian is at least the sum, not of the full Betty numbers, but the first K Betty numbers, but the first K in this reordered sense. So uh, dimension I, J, lambda. Uh, so for example, if you set, um, uh, if you set k equals to zero, uh, this is the sort of symplectic, this, is the, this would be the contact version where you'd have the full sum of the Betty numbers. <clears throat> um, okay, or maybe I mean it by n, I don't know, I may have gotten these ordering wrong. Okay, um, and of course, uh, I have to assume here that uh, lambda is transverse, that the image of lambda is transverse to uh, its the image, the image of lambda under the contact Hamiltonian isotopy is uh, uh, transverse to the uh, image, to uh, the image of the reflows under lambda. So this transversality condition. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, that's the main theorem that I wanna talk about. Maybe I should actually stop here and just see if there are any questions about this statement. I realize I didn't actually stop at all. Okay. So let's do some examples of, of applying this theorem and see what it says. Okay. Um, oh, I can probably put one in here. Okay, let's start with um, a basic example. So uh, I'm gonna choose M to be standard contact R2N uh, and lambda is a standard unknot n-dimensional L naught. Okay, so what does that look like in the front projection? So I have z, x1, and I'll draw the remaining directions here. Okay, and I have um, standard on naught looks something like this. Uh, so the question was, what's the definition of the Hoffer norm for contact Hamiltonian? So um, that's uh, back here. So max, the same, same, same format as for the symplectic one. Okay, um, no, was I here? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was here. Okay, so, uh, okay, so this is, this is, I gotta draw this in n dimension, so it'll look something like a sphere like this. And this has exactly uh, one rave chord here. 
Okay. And if you look downstairs, you'll see a whole SN minus one of these flows, these are holomorphic gradient flows and holomorphic curves, which I can't really draw again. So uh, if you look at the moduli space, a dimension K, um, with a positive cord at positive puncture at C and uh, negative punctures here, uh, and you mod out by the R translation. Uh, this is just going to be, um, unless you're eager to move on. Now, now that the sigma are really important, could you summarize their definition? Ah, okay. So, so the sigma measures. So sigma L from the symplectic story over here was look for. Uh, minimum area of any holomorphic disk. So now I have like a family of sigmas where I'm looking at I'm sort of the analog. It's looking at the minimum area, different minim uh, different minimal minimums of different types of moduli spaces of curves uh, of of these disks. Um, so yeah, so like let's look at this case. So this is going to be Sn minus one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. So that that's the moduli space of these curves. So that means that if you look at sigma k, this is going to be uh, infinity for zero less than k less than n, and it's just going to be the length of this chord for k equals zero or n. Um, also, also this fact that this is the moduli space of curves allows you to compute the differential. So you get that DC is zero. So that implies that the L in this theorem here, the L in this theorem um, is infinity. So it, it has an augmentation. You don't need to cut, the, cut down on the DGA. Um, so the theorem implies that uh, the number of Reeb chords uh, between L and its image Sorry, lambda. Lambda in its image uh, is at least two uh, if your contact Hamiltonian uh, is less than the length of the chord. Um, so this is just like the Legendrian unknot and T star of S1, uh, which I didn't actually draw, but um, and in fact, you can actually show it's not too hard. Um, you can show that. Uh, you can find a contact Hamiltonian such that its, ham its norm is just a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, uh, and it displaces the it displaces the uh, um, the Legendrian from itself. Oops, zero. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's a constructed proof. That's nothing to do with what I've talked about so far, but it just shows that that's sharp for, for this example. Um, okay, so I mentioned in the abstract of the title, uh, in the abstract of the talk, that you could use this for loose Legendrians. This is not a loose Legendrian. So let's do an example. Well, this one's not quite loose either, it's, but it's, it would be the one dimensional analog of, of a loose Legendrian. So um, let's say uh, M is R3. Uh, and lambda is a stabilized is a stabilized unknot. Okay, so um, again, drawing the front projection, it would look like uh, z x, and it would look something like this. And it doesn't have to be the same size. So I have two chords here. Okay, and um, if you uh, if you try to find the holomorphic curves in this case, you're going to have one going this way and one going that way. Um, and so uh, let's call this uh, U1 and U2. Okay, uh, and. Let's say, uh, so, okay, so if you count the, this is uh, one, but there's a, there's a shift in the R direction. So, um, 
if you mod out by this uh, shift in the R direction, so you basically just get a single element. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so that implies uh, first of all uh, DCI is one. So that means we're going to set our L to be equal to the minimum of LC1 and LC2. Okay. Uh, and then also I can choose a point here. I'm allowed to, this is the top dimension and I'm allowed to choose uh, one here is the dimension of the Legendrian. I'm allowed to choose a point, let's say like this. And since UI does not intersect uh, this point, cross R in the, in the uh, cylindrical Lagrangian and the symplectization. Uh, that implies we can make sigma zero and sigma one be infinity. So we don't have, these are not gonna cause a bound. Although it actually, I guess, doesn't really matter because the bound's gonna come from L. So this doesn't really help in this case to use this point. But uh, this is just to illustrate how you can use the point to help, to help out with your bound. Okay, so then the theorem implies that um, the uh, number of uh, red chords from uh, the Legendrian, between the Legendrian and its image is at least two uh, if uh, the Hamiltonian norm is less than L. Okay. All right, let me do one more example. Um, Um, so this one is actually a different flavor. Uh, it's, it's, the proof is not related to the serum, but um, let's pick M as R5. And let's let uh, lambda be the standard unknot uh, with a small loose chart. So I don't really, I'm not very good at drawing those sort of things, but um, at least I can draw the standard on that. Okay, so here we have the standard on that. Same picture as example one, but now it's only two dimensional. And right here, maybe I do a little um, Reitermeister one move or something, and I add in a little loose chart that we drew before that looks something like this. Um, okay. <coughs> uh, so then there's a constructed theorem. Um, which says that, uh, um, <clears throat> okay, so right. So first of all, what would our theorem say? So our theorem would say, well, as long as the Hamiltonian is smaller than the length of this tiny little thing, we can't displace it. Uh, which does not really saying very much. But in fact, uh, there exists a contact Hamiltonian H uh, with small oscillatory, small Hamil uh, Hoffer norm, uh, and such that there are no reports between uh, this original Legendrian and uh, its image under this Hamiltonian. Um, so I should say this is sort of a just a constructive proof, and I have it's based in four dimensions. So I have no idea. Uh, so okay, so so at least uh, for this example. Uh, the theorem is sharp, but I have no idea um, in general, uh, is this always true? Um, you know, uh, if I have a small little loose chart, does that all of a sudden mean that I can find some contact Hamiltonian that can displace it? I don't know. Um, okay, so I'll just pause here if there are any questions from the examples about the examples of theorem. Okay, Let's see, I got seven minutes left, so I should be able to get to the next statement. Um, all right, uh, so there's one more result that I wanted to mention that's, that's um, based on the same kind of persistence stuff. Um, so I'll call it a non-squeezing result. Uh, so let's again fix uh, some lambda one in our contact manifolds. Uh, and let's let um, uh, u lambda one 
be some uh, Weinstein. Now I'm suddenly feeling subconscious about how, is it Weinstein or? Uh, it's definitely Weinstein stuff. Okay, Weinstein, not Weinstein, uh, Jet Neighborhood of uh, Lambda 1. Okay, and let's let uh, Lambda 2, uh, we say that Lambda 2, also in the contact manifolds, uh, can be squeezed uh, into you, uh, or, in, well, actually any you, uh, if there exists a contact isotopy uh, phi, uh, such that, phi t, such that phi one of lambda two is in you, and um, if you look at uh, the homology class of this guy, it's not gonna be zero, um, the top homology class, uh, it's not gonna be zero with Z2 coefficients. Okay, and so then a theorem that uses the same sort of uh, barcode stuff as the previous one says that uh, suppose um, lambda one is loose or in the dimension or in the one dimensional case uh, stabilized. Uh, and lambda two has an augmentation. Then um, lambda two cannot be squeezed into this Weinstein neighborhood of lambda one. So, um, so just to uh, just to remark about this theorem and like why where this condition comes in. Uh, so some contrasting remarks. Um, so first of all, if I have for any for any lambda one, loose or not, uh, its Weinstein neighborhood has loose Legendrians that can squeeze into them, why well, that are already in there, that uh, squeezed in. Uh, you know, this this picture where if this is my lambda one, loose or not. Uh, I can kind of do some sort of C0 zigzaggy approximation and stay in this um, Weinstein neighborhood of <laughs> lambda one. Um, and okay, so that's, that's uh, the condition about why I'm assuming lambda two has an augmentation. It's sort of the exact opposite of, well, the far side of the spectrum from lambda two here being loose. Okay, uh, what about the homology condition? Uh, so supposing I take lambda two, uh, I can put it inside this uh, Weinstein neighborhood, but also in some Darboux chart in this Weinstein neighborhood. So something like this. So I can always do, if this is my loose Legendrian, I can always put a little augmented Legendrian inside a Darbu chart inside the Weinstein neighborhood. Uh, so in that condition, uh, but in that case, <coughs> this homology class is zero in, uh, well, with Z coefficients. Um, what about the Z2 statement? Uh, so, um, so supposing again, I have some loose guy, lambda one. Okay, and if I take the, if I take the two copy, uh, which I'll denote by two lambda, two lambda one, and I'll try to draw this. Okay, so something that looks like, goes around and then uh, goes again. Um, sorry, I actually, that was actually supposed to be a two copy, uh, dis disconnected, my, my bad about that. Um, okay, um, so uh, this lies in U lambda one and has by work of other people, 
uh, has an augmentation, even has a filling if you subscribe to these things. Um, but uh, if you look at the image, this guy is zero in um, this homology. Um, okay, so that sort of uh, is supposed to explain why we would want a condition like, like that. Okay, it is 1259. So I'm exactly at the beginning of the proof. So I think probably it's just best to stop there because otherwise I'm just gonna speak really quickly. So, um, so I'll end with uh, 40 seconds left. Okay, well, let's thank Mike for the talk. Thank you. So are there any questions from the audience? I think Baptiste, the question. Um, so you're be unmuted, so you can go ahead. Sorry, can you repeat that? Okay, maybe not. Oh. <laughs> um. Uh, I, I had a question. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. C can you explain remark two B? Ah. This part right here. Yes. Uh. Yeah. So this is a bad drawing, but um. If if I if I didn't have this condition, then there'd be a counter example because uh, I could take a if I take a loose like a loose knot a stabilized knot or something, and I take the two copy of it. There's this picture. Uh, let's see if I can draw this. Um, I take the two copy. I can find an augmentation, a, a filling sort of that looks like goes back to itself. And that Lagrangian filling is, um, I, don't, I forgot who did this, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, this is something I've heard from a number of people. So my apologies if I don't credit the right person. Well, I'm not going to credit the person, so I don't know who it is. Uh, but yeah, so such a two copy has um, uh, has an augmentation, uh, even if lambda one is loose. However, uh, its homology is zero in this co in in this uh, group. So that's why to uh, preclude that we we uh, we throw that into the definition of not being squeezed of, of being squeezed. Uh, so I think uh, Gregory McCalkin has a question. So sure. I just unmuted you. Go ahead. Is it not clapping sign? Ah, I'm sorry. Okay. That was clapping sign. <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, where is, okay, question, where is the persistence homology? Yes, uh, so that was in the proof, unfortunately. Um, so I didn't, I didn't, uh, I could maybe just say a, a brief word about it. Um, basically, uh, um, there's, uh, the proof involves, okay, so it's, I guess we're in the 15 minutes of overtime or stoppage time, as the previous speaker said. Uh, so, um, Right. So basically what you have to do is you have to look at sort of um, a sort of linearized Legendrian contact homology complex generated by mixed chords between a Legendrian and its image. And because you have a bifurcation analysis proof, you can watch the book. Okay, this, this uh, linearized contact homology could be acyclic because something maybe the Legendrian could be displaced off, off of itself. However, you see a certain set of bars that uh, represent the acyclicness. And uh, because you have a bifurcation proof, you can actually see 
Uh, you have kind of have a family of barcodes and you can measure how much energy it takes to make bars disappear. And um, yeah, and you watch the bars disappear one by one and that gives you your sort of partial sign. So it's, so it's the persistence of these bars. Um, so it's, um, yeah. So it's a little, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's persisting under the isotopy, uh, not so much persistence persisting under the uh, action window. Um, although that's also part of the story. So I'm slightly confused by, I mean, why does it matter whether we have a bifurcation analysis proof? Why can't we just run this with some continuation? Yes. Here? Yeah. So that is absolutely what one can do if you use the isometry theorem and barcode theory. So uh, if you could say that you have a small continuation that induces a small change in, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it? The bottleneck distance is small. Uh, then you can essentially run the same sort of argument. Uh, it's a little tricky though, because um, you're dealing with the linearized contact homology, not the full contact homology. And it's also, uh, it's also, you also have to study how augmentations work. So what's not mentioned here is um, the fact that the augmentation is only partially defined. So all that you have a better handle on if you have bifurcation analysis than um, continuation. Oh, okay, another question. Are you working with Z graded augmentations or Z2 graded? I believe that the Z2 copy thing has a Z2 augmentation, but not a Z augmentation. Um, okay, so I actually really wasn't working with any grading because, um, uh, okay, Lenny says, depends on, oh, you can, you can all read this. <laughs> depends on the choice of grading on the two copy link. Uh, so, um, Actually, I don't really need a grading for this discussion. Um, and uh, I should say that this is not necessarily just to disclude this example, but it's actually in the proof, um, some sort of study of bars. Um, but yeah, this, could, this discussion could have been about um, differential algebras instead of differential graded algebras. Are there any more questions? Okay, if there's no further questions, um, let's thank Mike again, and I think people will stick around for a few more minutes if anyone has any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I noticed that you posted the slides. If you want, I can just take pictures or something. I don't really have any PDFs to send you right now. Uh, that would be great if you could send us the, the scan notes or just a photo of them. Okay. On the website. Mike? Yeah. While I have you, can you, can you, you, you made some point that I didn't completely understand. So 
I understand the, sort of the point about problem like distance and needing to prove the continuations kind of are, what's the word? Well, you need to know, understand the behavior continuation under the Hofer norm. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you said something else which kind of puzzled me about, um, I mean, why is this, again, I'm sorry, why is this harder with continuations than with bifurcation? Um, well, in principle, it shouldn't be harder, but um, there, you would need, okay, so, right, okay. Um, working backwards. So the barcodes are what you want to get at at the end because the barcodes represent how much of the homology is how much of the reeb cords are surviving the isotopy. Okay. They represent endpoints of bars. So you need to be able to say something like, okay, if I have a contact Hamiltonian isotopy below a certain norm, then the bars uh, that were of a certain length between that represent, whose endpoints represent mixed cords, uh, survive. Um, so that's, that's kind of using the connection between this so-called, uh, I think it's called the isometry theorem or the stabilization theorem, I can't quite remember, and persistence homology theory, which says something to the effect of, uh, you know, the, con the uh, continuation map being of a certain size means the barcodes are of a certain size. And somehow you currently Barco don't use that result? I don't use that result, no. Um, instead, I say, okay, because we have bifurcation analysis, we know exactly how the DGA is changing during these isolated moments. Okay. It's basically a stable tame auto, uh, isomorphism, kind of like the DGA analog of handle slides and birth deaths. And in fact, on the linearized level, it is essentially handle slides and birth deaths. Plus there's some other thing, cords can move, can move in and out of action windows. That's another thing we need. Uh, we need to restrict the action window so that our augmentation is well defined on that action window because we don't have a global augmentation. Uh, so with the bifurcation analysis, we can more directly control all those things. How, how big is, on what size DGA is augmentation defined? Uh, how much, once it's defined, let's look at the bars, how much of the bars changed, things like that. Um, but there's no like contradiction that says, well, if you don't have bifurcation, it's not going to work. Okay. And I, and, but also this means that if you want to do like a parametric version of this, then you would have uh, more difficulties with your current method, presumably. Ah, because the bifurcation option gets nastier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that, that would, that would be the, that sounds definitely true. Um, but like I said, I think it's not actually an obstruction in that, you know, <clears throat> one could try to port over this barcode stuff to okay. continuations. Okay, thank you. I have to sure. put someone. Okay, sure thing. Uh, uh, hi, Mike. Uh, this is Oleg. Oh, hi. hi. Um, so, so I have a couple questions. Uh, first, I was wondering um, if if the Lagrangian is being isotoped. In the, like you, you push it off a little bit off itself, doing like positive rep flow, and then the rest of the isotopy is like happening in the complement. Uh, not necessarily, but you're saying, oh, if it does. If, if it does, do, yeah. do, do you always have like many um, rep cords between the two? Um, well, not, not if you've displaced it, you know, like, uh, I mean, let's see, who was that example? Uh, I don't have it anymore. I can find it. Um, no, I mean, you don't always. It depends if you can displace it horizontally, right? Like, you know, this well, sort of example. You could just... If you, if you first move it up a little bit and then start displacing it horizontally, then it will, I think, intersect the original one. Yeah, that's true, too. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm just... Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about, I guess, a more restricted type of isotopy. Like, like I mean, I'm, I'm not saying anything about the, the Hofer norm, but I'm allowing 
Um, like it's so it's more general and it's more restrictive. Um, uh huh. So you're so, saying, um, like like I guess I was wondering, like you know how much. Um, yeah, you can do this horizontal isotopy, but then that intersects the original one at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you don't have any rep cords between the two. But if you if you don't allow, like, I'm trying to just see, like, is is like the content that you have to like go through the original one. Um, um, well, no, but you would still have rep cords if you push it up a little bit and then shift it off itself. You would still have rep cords between the two. Uh, you know, even as you go through this. Uh, double point of, or the zero length mixed chord. Uh, okay, so I, I shifted up a little bit. So now, now they're disjoint, mm -hmm. and now I'm allowed to isotope the the positive one in any way so that it doesn't cross. Okay. And I guess my my question is, now do do do, do you always have uh, very very many? Yeah, I, I I believe so because. Uh, um, we're, we're, we're just, I mean, so you're, you're sort of thinking of the isotopy in terms of the link, but, uh, the isotopy yeah, yeah, statement, exactly. the isotopy statement is in terms of the, only the original one, the link is just for the proof. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So, so you think if, if I think about it in terms of the link, then, then, then probably like what, what I'm saying is, is true. If I preserve the link. Yeah. Maybe that. Yeah. Okay. And, and also for this, for this unknot, it's example one. Example one. Uh, lost my example one. Uh, so it's just oh, this, just uh, just a standard unknot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so so you're saying there's this isotopy where I just move it to the right, but that isotopy um, has a large Hofer norm. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And then examples two and three. Is the, the main difference is, is flexibility and height between low and high? Is that? Yeah. Nice? Okay. Right. Okay. So, so uh, that's all. The main difference is the LCH is not interesting for these two examples. Um, uh -huh. But you still have, in this case, because you have a large Darbu, uh, sorry, large loose neighborhood, um, you still have, you, you still require a lot of Hoffer energy. And in this case, when you have a small loose neighborhood, you don't require a lot of. Um, okay. Okay. Hopper energy. Right. right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Sure. I have a question. Can you, can you go back to the definition of uh, sigma k? Sigma k. So, uh, was this meant to be like a supremum over all almost complex structures or something like that? Ah. I. It's not gonna really matter because this moduli space, if it's not empty for one chord, it's gonna not be empty for one almost complex structure. It's gonna be not empty for the that same. Um, I guess that's what right. I was wondering about because if it's a if it's k dimensional moduli space, is it clear that the non emptiness is a, is independent of j? Right. Um, Right, okay, let's think. Um, yeah, and in this case, for this sort of contact manifold, you can actually look at these guys down in the projection where you kind of have, um, this is, by the way, this is not, this, that, the, exi the study of these moduli spaces is not something we did. Well, actually, it's something that Yorgos did with uh, three, this, uh, th three other people. Um, Batiste, I don't know if anyone, uh, Batiste, um, Paolo, and Roman. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so there they studied kind of the mo higher dimensional moduli space in the projection. It was part of their, um, you know, generation of Fukaya category or something. And uh, I believe there it is independent of J. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess if you want to be totally safe about it, you could say, let's just make it infimum over J. Uh, I don't really have any 
example where that makes it different. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question is, um, you mentioned this idea of adding up point constraints to try to make sigma bigger, right? Yeah, that was, uh, so that in was the example, you, you added like a boundary point constraint. Yeah, it's a boundary point constraint. Oh, did I not say that? I see. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's supposed to be a boundary point constraint on the Lagrangian boundary. I see. But could you also do something like add an interior point constraint or? Um, I don't know. I feel like those things are less invariant somehow. Um, so you mean a, a kind of has to be of the right dimension, right? So, um, you know, this is not going to be. This is an n-dimensional Legendrian, um, and I guess, this is, I guess in your example, that probably wouldn't be very interesting because you could just move the point off. Mm -hmm. But if you're in like a closed contact manifold, like S2 and minus one, that might give you more. No, but I'm thinking, isn't it the wrong dimension still? Because so say you, say you take a point in the symplectization um, and you make it, well, you got to make it, you want it to be probably holomorphic. So it would be point cross. Um, what would it even be? Uh, well, whatever it is, uh, you know, the moduli space is only tracing out um, n plus one, n plus two dimensions, right? And your point is in a two n plus two dimensional space. So um, for it to be a re reasonable constraint, it would have to. Uh, yeah, I guess it would screw up the grading of everything because it would cut down the dimension. Too much, yeah. You know. But even if you try to do some kind of filtration like that with interior points, you always have to watch out that uh, the points don't disappear, go to the boundary and disappear. Yeah. That's, a, that's a problem in floor uh, Lagrangian, you know, boundary version, relative version. I just had a random comment more than a question. Uh, thanks very much for your talk, by the way, Mike. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I'm uh, um, imagining this kind of just came up and, um, as you know, your remark one, the, one of the things you were saying about non-squeezing, um, you know, I'm imagining you might also try to use these, uh, these numbers to sort of, uh, you know, obtain estimates on sizes of standard neighborhoods or something like that. So you, mm. you, um, you know, it, it seemed, of course, it seems weird at first glance that a, a loose Legendrian squeezes into a neighborhood of a standard Legendrian, but not vice versa. But then you, then if you think about it, it's because the loose Legendrian has like, a, you know, kind of a really small standard neighborhood. Um, because that's size of that standard neighborhood is mm -hmm. in some sense smaller than the size of the loose chart. The loose chart doesn't fit in it. Um, right. Yeah, so you're saying that that would be some sort of um, a bound on this, the one jet neighborhood of any Legendrian loose or not? Uh, I mean, just a lower bound. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I didn't uh -huh. have a kind of very coherent thing to say, but it just, it just yeah. seemed from that non-squeezing example that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's you, a good you idea. Might... Um, I've definitely tried to think of like what might be the analog of those, um, you know, spectral uh, embedding capacities in ECH, mm -hmm. and maybe something like that is a step in that direction. So. Yeah, good idea. So, um, some, something I should say is that uh, I think that theorem, like the last theorem, is true not just for loose Legendrians, but um, if the Legendrian is, uh, has trivial DGA, 
Uh, which is the last theorem again? This the uh, squeezing thing. The uh, ah yes. This one. You're saying if if lambda two has a trivial. Uh, no, I think it's if lambda one is has trivial DGA. Oh, lambda. Sorry, you said lambda one is trivial DGA. Yeah. Okay, generalizing that. Yeah. Uh huh. Ah. Then lambda two can't be squeezed you mean, into it. You mean for some sort of like uh, some symplectic cabordism map or something that sends um, one to. So, so there's there's a map from yeah yeah. So if one Legendrian is is C zero close to another Legendrian, there's there's yeah there's a um, a map between like the the partially wrapped categories or like uh, yeah this this like Legendrian DGA. Well, well, okay. Actually, there's no map between the Legendre DGAs, but there's there's a functor between the categories. Um, okay. Sorry, so, you're saying if there's a squeezing? Yeah, yeah. If 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 yeah. um, let me see. Okay, can I be squeezed into? Yeah. So if lambda two sits inside a neighborhood of lambda one, which is what which is what this uh, the situation is, then then there's a there there's a functor from the Pekai category of lambda one, the partial wrapped Pekai category of lambda one into the partial wrap category of lambda two. Um, and, but, but let me say, there's actually no map on the DGAs. Um, From that functor. Yeah, yeah, because, because the, the DGA is kind of the self-harm of the, the linking disk. And the linking disk doesn't go to the linking disk, it goes to some twisted complex. Um, but, but in any case, there's, there's a functor, um, and hmm. anyway, so yeah. After after seeing your paper, I actually thought a little bit about this, and uh, th this is this is written up in in a paper um, that I have online. But you know, it's okay. of course inspired by this. Um, so, oh, like which paper is this? This is the geometric and uh, algebraic presentations of. Wine sheet domains, I think, is what's called. Got it's it, my got last. It. It's my last paper, um, but but I, I guess I guess the relevance here is that um, instead of lambda one being loose, you can um, say the same thing where lambda one is uh, has has trivial DGA. But just but just to understand, you said it's at the at the wrapped. Well, it's at the Fukaya category level. But not a map on DGA. So how do you get yeah, the yeah. conclusion so, for the DGA? Well, so the thing is, okay, there's there's a several there's several things. Lambda two it claims lambda two doesn't have an augment. Okay, suppose lambda two does sit inside lambda neighborhood of lambda one, mm -hmm. and and lambda one has like trivial DGA. Then then it's not necessarily the case that lambda two has trivial DGA. Um, so there's there's examples. Okay. Where, and and the and and well and the, the the wrapping number, the homology, this projection is is one. But even though it doesn't have any doesn't even though it doesn't have trivial DGA, it still doesn't have any augmentations. Uh-huh. So so yeah. So, so you're using the augmentation category or something or uh, like. yeah, kind of. Yeah, that's partially wrapped categories this uh, oh, yeah. Uh, do you, I forget, in your, in your version, do you assume that this um, homology class is one or just that it's not in zero? Um, I, I also don't remember, but, but there's some condition on the homology class. I mean, yeah, okay, the, the assumption might be, well, again, it, it, it depends on whether you care about um, Z graded augmentations or Z mod two. But but there's still a homology assumption. It, it, it might be that you work over the homology over Z coefficients and you assume it's like one instead of just non-zero. Um, but 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 I would say that the main the main point is that like lambda two can be inside a neighborhood of lambda one, but and it doesn't have augmentations, but it still might be non-trivial. And, and the, the homology class is one. Um, so, so, so there are such examples. Um, those are all in your, this paper you put up? 
Um, These examples? The examples, yeah, I think the examples are there. Um, I mean, the examples are not like, I mean, they're based off Mark McLean's work, I would say. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's in there. Uh -huh. Okay. But I just want to say, I, I think this, this, this theory of looseness is, is not essential for this result. Of course, all the other results I have no idea about because you're doing some quantitative invariants. I, I can't say mm -hmm. anything about that. Um, but I think just for this last thing, I think uh, looseness can be weakened. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely our proof could not be weak, weakened without this flexibility. So uh -huh. that's interesting. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to get that from our approach. As far as like thinking, running my mind through it right now, I don't think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying anything about the quantitative invariants. I, I, have, I can't say anything about that for sure. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, thanks again for the invitation. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for a great talk. And uh, yeah. also thanks for sticking around for questions. Oh yeah, and thanks for uh, also uh, <laughs> indulging me in my non-technological manner, so. Oh, I actually liked it a lot. I, I, I thought it was surprisingly, it worked surprisingly well. Oh yeah. You know, what, yeah. what's nice is that you can hear the pencil writing it's kind of a nice touch uh-huh without almost like a chalk sound yeah it's almost like that chalk sound we all miss so. yeah okay all right i'm going to sign off then okay see you in all a right. bit bye